Hi everyone, this is uh, Sasha Hodder. We're on the Hoddle cast and today is January 9th and we have our guest uh, today is Chris Groshong. And uh, thank you for coming on, Chris. Maybe you could give a little background on yourself, how you got into Bitcoin. Yeah, hey Sasha, thanks for having me on the show. Great to catch up with you again. Uh, it's been almost a year since we've like first started hanging out. In the yeah, I think we space. met at a strip club if I remember correctly. <laughs> Well, I know we had our first conversation at a strip club. Yeah. That was uh, that goes to show you that's uh, Bitcoin Miami, the North American Bitcoin Conference at its finest. Yeah, uh, we did meet at a, at a house party prior to. Right, right. <laughs> but yeah, we really didn't get to know each other until we were like at a strip club. That is, uh, that's not exactly the uh, the most normal normal way of. Uh, but hey, it's a good memory, right? I yeah. Mean, I was, uh, there's not too many, uh, too many times you can say that. So mm -hmm. Especially uh, like, in, you know, now I know you in a fairly professional setting and it's like, <laughs> it kind of sounds funny that we met that way. But yeah, I mean, right. We've gotten a lot of trouble for that party, I think. Yeah, I wonder how things will turn out this year, especially since we were just mentioning, it doesn't seem like a lot of people are going to be um, attending uh, mm -hmm. this year, whether that's a fact of, where the prices are or or what i mean that that was that was the case back in 2015 to 2014 2015 when the price had started to tank is that people stopped showing up to conferences the only people that were showing up to conferences were people who were building which was awesome that's how i met all these really amazing great people um 2014 and 2015 so that's uh the best thing that i can give advice for other people right now is even though the market may be down if you do choose to go to a conference, you know, research the ones that uh, are going to be bringing in good speakers and people who are knowledgeable. And then you'll be surprised how much more access you'll have to those types of people because of the, the, the get rich quickers are, are not showing up anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it'll, well, hopefully we'll see, it'll cut through a lot of the noise. So you get to actually have some meaningful conversations with people you meet and then oh, we'll see how I'm going to it, but I'll be able to report back in a few weeks how uh, it, it was just crazy last year. I remember walking around looking at all those Lambos and all the people there. It was, it was kind of exciting and very scary too, for some reason. Like, I don't know why it was so scary, but it was just like none of the projects, I, like I, I knew enough to know most of those projects were not real and it was just a lot of hype, but it was it was insane. I mean, it was the biggest conference to date at the at that point, and mm -hmm. to see that many people walking around for a crypto conference was pretty insane. It, it, it did feel magical uh, in a yeah. sense. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, so back to my my, <laughs> back my background. Back. Yeah. So I I got started in 2012. I first heard about it in 2011 from a conspiracy theorist friend who's a libertarian and voluntarist, and he's since left California and moved moved back but he uh, got me hooked a, a little bit. And the problem was I was, uh, I was creating a video production company I already had, and I was in the middle of that. So I was in like year two of the company, and I didn't really think that, well, one, there wasn't like a lot of resources to go out and learn about it, which is where I really started um, talking to people was on Twitter initially because there wasn't a lot of like I said places to go to find out how this stuff was and how many times can you read the white paper bef without you know having somebody help explain some of those concepts to you so that's when I started going to look for meetups and things so I could start talking to people about what was going on but that wasn't until 2013 really so what happened in between 2011 and 2012 was I just let it go and at the end of 2012 uh, my friend started talking to me about it again, and I realized that my video production company was probably not going to make it because of the competitive nature of Southern California and the amount of cost to upgrade the uh, cont uh, the, the the computers and the screens because everything was switching and like just the the prosumer grade gear for cameras was just incredibly it was changing every year and the price was just too much to keep up with mm -hmm. so so i said well let's dig into this crypto thing a little bit more and i decided like most people hey mining sounds like an easy way to get in <laughs> right <That's>, yeah <laughs> everybody goes oh, i just 
do some, uh, plug some, some something in and do it. Well, it wasn't that easy in 2012. And I did some with a GPU on my computer. And then I was going to buy a Butterfly Labs miner in December of 2012. And I waited two weeks. I went back and the price had doubled. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> the same machine is now twice the price. And that's when I started really digging into Bitcoin. And, and that was when I realized in early 2013 that this was the this was going to be the future and that's, I needed to be a part of it and I wasn't sure how, but, um, but that was my first foray. Oh, that's exciting. I bought my first Bitcoins through Mt. Gox actually. Oh, wow. So have you been involved in that whole uh, lawsuit and everything? I actually got a letter for the class action from Japan. I have that. It's, it's more of a memorabilia since I think I only had a, like point 0.1 or less left on the exchange. Oh, so, that's good. Yeah. So I, I was able to get what I had off. Um, and I learned three really valuable lessons by buying those coins on Gox in 2013 in April. So it was the week of the spike that it went from uh, like 80 to 240. Oh, wow. And, right. And that doesn't sound like a big deal where, where we are now, but at the time, I was the, it was the highest all-time high. It was 240 yeah. was an all-time high. I remember and, I was on a plane and I was listening to a podcast and this port, or she, it was a portfolio manager at my mutual fund company, Christine Hughes, and she used to follow Bitcoin and like I never had bought any, but I knew of it just through her. And uh, she said it was 240. And I remember just like this sinking feeling being like, I meant to figure out how to buy some and now it was too late. I was like, oh, it's already up at 240. Like so expensive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in order to do this, I had to wire money to Japan, which I had never done an international wire transfer before. So I sent 500 did, bucks. Did the wire cost like a hundred dollars to send it 50, or 50? 50 was 10, yeah. So it was basically 10% of my, of what I wanted to, you know, just try it out. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I just remember going, man, that's kind of a lot of money to send uh, 500 bucks. That sucks. And mm -hmm. then it was the week. So I had made this, finally made the decision that I was going to do this. And the price was at like $85. I'm like, okay, let's do this. Well, that week, while I'm waiting for my money to clear in Japan, it starts moving like crazy. And I am not like, I'm not, a, I'm a biotech guy. I have a degree in genetics. That was my classical training through college and what I did before crypto and, and video production stuff. So I wasn't like a trader. I didn't understand psychology of markets. So I get this message on like Friday afternoon. Hey, your uh, money has been deposited. Go and do it. Go and trade. Well, the I've been watching the price every day skyrocket to like now it's at two forty, and I'm like, oh my god, what am I gonna do? Buy, 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 right? Well, of I, course, you know, yeah. With that the mentality of it, when it's on a run. <laughs> yeah. So tw tw you know, less than twenty four hours later, the price is drop back down to 140 Aww. right and i realized okay well here's the imp why is bitcoin so important if i had been able to send value when i wanted to do on the day that i wanted instead of waiting five days i would have been able to have like twice as many uh of what i wanted probably mm -hmm. purchase twice as many bitcoins and and that's when i and it would have cost so much less to to send and i would have you know all of these things that the efficiencies and the speed at which money should work and how it doesn't. I was like, Oh my God, this is the perfect test case. Like this is exactly why crypto needs to be a solution for money transfer and money management. Mm -hmm. And I just, I was, I was in love with it and hooked from that point. And I also learned a lot about psychology and I was like, well, for 500 bucks, that's a really great lesson. Yeah. True. And, I and I still got to keep some Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Um, and it made me dig in deeper and learn more. So every time someone gets stuck at like buying at a near an all time high, if you don't get rid of your coins, it should be forcing you to learn more about the technology unless you just are just going to stick it on the shelf and then come back to it later. But mm -hmm. me, did you keep those fun. ones? Yeah, they're oh, good for you. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're around somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. Or I may have spent those particular ones, wow. but. Yeah, they 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 got them off the exchange, and I and they were they were used. Um, and uh, but the you know I think it was it was 
all of these little things that started leading to like the aha moments and the light bulbs of like, oh my gosh, this industry is not going away and you can't turn this stuff off. And how do I help people get into it? And so that's when I started working in 2014 with the San Diego Bitcoin meetup group and helping with uh, Edge, which was then known as Airbits. Oh yeah, with right? Paul. Yeah, so Paul Poy and I, um, Paul was actually one of the first people I met in crypto, we had uh, lunch together in the, an afternoon, and I told him, hey, I wanna get involved, I don't know what I wanna do. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, just keep going to events and doing and talking to people and something will probably show itself. And uh, he's always been very supportive of me and Coinstructive, and so uh, we always really appreciate uh, the, edge, the Edge guys and their, and their efforts. Uh, it's a great wallet, I highly recommend it and use it. Um, quite often I use it too yeah and it, it's good for giving uh, people it's easy you can create a wallet and give it as a gift sometimes too like for I give it if someone has a baby I usually give them an edge wallet like I'll just set it up for them and then give them the passwords for it who knows if they'll use it but that's cool I like that mm -hmm. that's a nice gift if and they don't, if they don't lose it it is <laughs> I, yeah I know uh, I have I had one guy who actually purchased like ten dollars um a, wa a long long time ago and could not recover his his wallet mm -hmm. and that's a bummer you know it just goes to show you that it's really easy to lose and we're we're still we're still not with the tools that are available for everyday users really that's the, that's one of the biggest problems still you know mm -hmm. yeah okay. i mean coinbase is pretty easy to use but if you trust them well yeah i mean that's the that's the whole thing right letting somebody else manage your keys is is easy but it also is a high high risk um did so. you participate in that uh january 3rd proof of keys event didn't really need to yeah very good <laughs> <laughs> um don't really keep things on the exchange uh, at all unless i'm actually going to do i'm not like i'm not a trader so mm -hmm. i didn't pull everything off the exchange to do that so yeah. um, for me it was it was, I liked the concept of proof of keys and I but I just didn't know one whether how many people actually keep stuff on when and if you're doing it for work or if you're a fund or do you, are you really going to pull out your your collateral so that you can you know and empty and empty all your positions and I mean it seemed like a lot of work plus everything every transfer is a fee yeah. so associated to it so like how much is this going to cost you and how much time would you lose and does it benefit your business i mean for the average consumer sure but for someone who's running a business it didn't to me didn't make any sense so i don't think you're going to get an accurate portrayal of what a, a proof of keys would do but i like the idea i definitely yeah i agree Tra i like the trace idea is, trace mayer is a really smart guy and i had the fortune of meeting him back in 2015 as well mm -hmm. And he's got a lot of great insights and he's done a lot for the community. So. Nice. Yeah. The, and so uh, what is, what is your company Coinstructive? Can you give us like a little overview of what you do there? Yeah. So when through working with the Bitcoin meetup group, I, I noticed that there was a huge gap in education as well as just the understanding of the applications of blockchain technology. So what I decided was, there had to be a way to create and add value through consulting. And in 2015, you can imagine there wasn't really a lot of people doing blockchain and crypto consulting. I mean, until ICOs popped up and everybody became a consultant. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it was one of the things that I was happy to talk about because, you know, I say we started before ICOs and plan to be around after ICOs. Mm -hmm. And, and, with education, right, one of the things that we look for is we help startups as well as enterprise level companies. So if you're a startup, let's say, we like to come in and offer what we call business unit as a service. So we find that a lot of startups have like two founders normally, or at least a founder and then a second person who's highly qualified to cover another one of the top three critical areas to get a company off the ground. And so if you make this triangle, right, and you put at the top, let's say the CEO and cover operations, well, then you also have a marketing and sales at one 
other point of the triangle. And then you have um, CTO and technical build stuff on the other point, right? And we find that companies, when they're standing themselves up, usually only have two out of those three areas where they're strong in. So what we'll do is we'll come in and we'll facilitate the role of that other uh, other piece of the triangle. So when we can help stand, it's hard to stand up a table with two legs. So that's where we like to come in. Uh, and then for on the enterprise side, we've been talking to companies about how they can apply blockchain technologies to certain projects that they want to look into and explore uh, using. And so um, that that is a much longer and slower sales cycle. So it's not one of the main things that we focus on, but it, it still does provide and stick to some of our core values and tenets, which are providing good, reliable information so that people can make confident business decisions. And I think we've all been in a situation in the past or at some point in our lives where we didn't feel like we had enough information to make a good decision going forward. Mm -hmm. And that really sucks for people when then that's their job, like is to know enough to make the decision. And if you can't, a lot of people just say no, um, or they end up spending way too much money because they didn't have enough understanding that what they were trying to build was not really even going to be uh, able to be accomplished. So I feel like there's a, there is a lot of value to being able to provide uh, enough of an understanding and education so that people can feel like they can make some of those decisions on their own. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And I think like, I've seen that a lot on the regulatory side of things. It's like, if there's any doubt, the easy and safe answer is always no. And that sometimes really hurts the company if it's something that they could do, but no one's willing to take the risk of saying, well, we don't know exactly, but this might be, you know, like, for instance, stable coins. This morning, I was looking at it for a client that wanted to know if they're a security or not. And if they are a security, like it's, it would be very detrimental to this uh, person's business model. And everyone I ask, like, oh, yeah, they're, they're security because they're asset backed. And then it's like, well, they're asset backed to cash. So does that make them automatically security? I don't know. It's a big, I'm still working it through of what the answer there is. But I kind of think they're not a security. But it's just, I, I notice like with everything, with money transmission or any, any regulatory thing, the, the easy answer is always no if there's not like a really deep understanding of something. Well, I've looked into stable coins for quite a while and I was involved in a stable coin project that failed already. Oh, do you know? Do you th what do you think they are? Are they securities or? So, well, there's two types of stable coins. The one you talked about, which are asset backed, and then there's the algo controlled, algorithmically controlled and um, uh, uh, stable coins where they don't have any assets in the bank backing them right oh, okay so the one you're talking about i would look into derivatives and swaps which mm -hmm. do fall under securities derivatives so, aren't there like that's what it that's what the line i was going through earlier too and then derivatives are not specifically listed in the 1933 act as like one of the ways to get to a security swaps i think and like certain options things are so i think it's a really fine line but i think the derivative is like if it's a stock or something like it's something linked to a stock where you're gonna see a, you still have that expectation of profit not that you're using the howey test but just in general like in the the you know why the act was even created is all of these things have an expectation of profit in them and the stable coins don't like they're different in that respect. So the derivative to cash is different than like a derivative to something else that's a security and fluctuates. Um, yeah. With that expectation. So. Yeah, you know, you're you're totally right. I also think it it is the way in which the uh, platform is set up and how they write some of their contracts about like wh what they're selling. Like mm -hmm. if you're going to partake in, in the system, uh, is it, is it a closed system? Is it their own blockchain? Is it permission, permission less? Like what is there mining involved? Right. You know, like if they're just issuing and based on like what everybody else is doing against dollars in the bank, it's, I think it's a lot less of a, I mean, how many other people are doing it? I see there's a lot, a lot less of a gray line there. I mean, Gemini has one. I mean, Tether's Tether's been around for a long time. Um, 
I can't think. I know like USDT. Uh, no, wait, that is that right. Ethereum one, DAI. Uh, yeah, DAI. Well, it, uh, yeah, DAI, DAI is a little different, but there's also like true USD, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there's well, a lot of different. Yeah, there's, there's a lot so of <laughs> there's a lot of different ones, and I mean, and, you know, I I would imagine that each of these exchanges are going to then start to look at having their own. Mm -hmm. If if a few of them can do it, then why wouldn't they all? Yeah. And then how does that work? Like, I think that it just becomes a real, a real mess in the future. I mean, it allows people to put something in stable, but then they're still stuck on that platform. Mm -hmm. It's the same problem of having dollars in the bank at that point, because if they want, they just freeze your account and all your dollars are frozen. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of, it used to be like people might, if like in the earlier days before Tether, I think when people might move their money into Litecoin or Bitcoin or something, and then it would make the market more volatile, but traders could profit off that. And now it's like, I think a lot flatter when people just move it into that. But Yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, I'm still looking at stablecoin projects, actually. Um, there's, they still fascinate me. I think they can offer a lot of good in the world. And I think that the, the disintermediation of central banks is still one of the goals of, of cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And a stable coin of some sort is one of the steps I think that would lead to that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, helping support and look into other projects that, that are trying to accomplish it because I think it's something that humanity needs. Hmm. Okay. I don't. So one, yeah. one of the other, one of the other things that uh, Coinstructive does is also help build tech. So we scope projects all the way from the ground up and we do have some developers that we contract with. So they're not, on staff full time, but we work with to help people build. And we've scoped out certain projects on that includes everything, you know, like like a software requirement specification document and, and including APIs. So, and that basically gives the company a blueprint of exactly what they've determined they want to build with basically the whole blueprint essentially, right? Which, which is, I think the biggest problem with a lot of companies is they, have a concept and a white paper with no thought process really gone into like, how is this going to work for the user and what, what are the actual components that we need to hook things up to get it to work? Because if you actually start to do that, that's when you start to realize, Oh, maybe we can't even physically, this is not capable. We're not capable of doing this. Like we need to think out of a, a different way to do it and rewrite the, rewrite the white paper. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I feel like there's a huge value that even after the fact you have the blueprint, you don't have to use us to even build. You can go shop that around, right? But at least now you have something tangible that you can say to somebody other than a white paper, this is our plan to build it. We're going to map all this out and show everybody how we're going to build it. And then you, and then we assign, uh, uh, people and budget it and put timelines together and so that you can you know go out and actually try to raise some capital with an actual plan as opposed to just um a hope you know, and a dream <laughs> yeah uh just a big smoke and mirrors so mm -hmm. so yeah there's Oh, I really yeah. like that. I love that you have the technical side because I've seen a lot of like a lot of companies have come to me and wanted help, you know, writing their white paper or things like or their business plan, but they don't have the technical side together yet. And so it's exactly what you just said. Like they, if you if you can't really write any of that stuff unless you know what they're building. And I, oftentimes they don't know either. They've heard blockchain will help in their industry and they just want to capture that piece of the market without a full understanding. And so someone like if they could get someone to help them with that technical side, that must go a long way. I, I think so. I think it really helps put the whole thing into perspective is the project, the whole project into perspective. I mean, you can assign when you can assign a dollar value to your workers and the contractors and the components and then break them into time frames and uh, it and actually have the documentation of what needs to be built like if i show that to a dev shop they're going to be like whoa this is way more than people ever bring us and then you can get competitive 
quotes from different companies as opposed to just sticking with a company and then making revisions and kind of building it as you go. Don't get me wrong. Tech companies who help build, companies build stuff like that love that because they just have the company on the hook forever. And but they, yeah. And then once they've got them, you can't, the company can't go anywhere. They can't question it because it's beyond their understanding. It's quite, we're quite a bit at, at their mercy once it, uh, once it gets started. Yeah, <clears throat> exactly. And, and that way we think that it gives us, um, it gives us more credibility in the space because we're not looking to pump any particular uh, technology or uh, back anything. We're pretty much agnostic. It's like I said, we, we will even help companies do market research up front. And that's usually some of the things uh, like smaller engagements before we start to work on things like that. Whereas the company doesn't even know what are the different options or who are potential companies competitive projects in the space and you really need to have a full grasp of what you're getting yourself into before you like, I'm going to be the first to do this. Well, there's actually six other people doing it. Would you, yeah. would you like to know about them? Uh, would you <laughs> nope. Like, would we you... want to be the first. <laughs> <laughs> right. <kidding. laughs> exactly. Um, and, and I've even, I've even said, Hey, would you like an introduction to some of these people to talk about what they're building? And, mm -hmm. and you'd be surprised. Like, yeah, some people do do want help, and some people don't, and 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 that's fine. But yeah, you see it, you see the gamut across the board. Like uh, it, the, at least as far as how people approach wanting to build something. So it it is it is fun and it is challenging, and I love being able to work on new technologies and find out about different uh, applications and different protocols and how people can build on top of those because. Like I still believe in a multi-chain world. I, I am a big fan of Bitcoin, but it, it doesn't do everything. And I think that there's going to be a lot of different options for us in the future. And I think there'll be more interoperability and we won't have to worry about cross-chain as much. But I do believe in multi-chains and, um, and I think that people will have options in the future. Mm -hmm. And um, how would you say like adoption is coming along like from your perspective? Like from what you've seen, uh, you know, working in the trenches, I guess, with people, uh, do you think it's it's moving at a good speed or? I think it's doing better than VR. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I think uh, if you want to measure it against other emerging technologies, I think it's catching on faster. Mm -hmm. I see still more, more content creation. There's more crypto influencers now than ever before and oh, yeah. <laughs> there's there's a lot of people who are building and building tools to make things easier for people so i i really think that we are on a path to adoption there's more merchants that are off uh, accepting crypto now than ever before and yeah we've had some setbacks in the crypto industry and there are still a lot of Miss, there's still a lot of misinformation that's being spread and people are leery and, and, and I, and I get it. Uh, it, if I hadn't been in for as long as I could or have been, I think I would be scared to, to dip even a big toe in. Mm -hmm. So I, I totally understand where people are coming from, uh, w with, you know, w adoption, uh, regarding the space. But I, I really do think within the next two years, you're going to see even a greater, it's, it's lot to me, adoption's logarithmic, right? I mean, look at like, just like Facebook, right? Facebook started out small and then it, all of a sudden it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that, you know, money's a harder thing for people or value transfer is a harder thing for people to adopt and have trust in. Cause that's one of the biggest questions I always get from new people as well. Where's the value? How do I trust this? And I mean, you have to really break it down for people, and and that's where money, that's money is really based on trust. A lot of it. So uh, I think adoption and trust go hand in hand. And and if you can't build trust, then you're not going to get adoption. And so all these hacks are these. I mean, it's horrible for people wanting to to get into the industry because it's not only, I mean, not only can you mess things up yourself, but someone can hack you. 
if you're yeah. on an exchange and and nobody wants to lose a lot of money or any actually right so yeah yeah there's the kidnapping thing uh someone was demanding it i just saw it this morning some i think it was like one of the richest ladies in is it norway or somewhere um somewhere overseas was kidnapped and uh they were demanding monero as a payment yeah, it just always seems like lately this year, and there's a lot of, well, not just this year, <laughs> there's always a lot of bad headlines about Bitcoin being used for uh, nefarious activities and stuff. So I think the main public is still a little leery of it from that. But uh, even despite all that, you know, you see all the headlines, oh, Bitcoin's dead, Bitcoin's dead. But meanwhile, like what price were we at three years ago? Like. Three hundred dollars, and now mm -hmm. it's at you know even at three thousand. It's still a pretty nice um, increase over time. It just you can't look oh, yeah. at it, you know, despite the volatility that goes along with it. Well, that's one of the when you I hadn't heard about the the lady from Norway um, being. Kidnapped. I don't even know if she was from Norway, oh, but well, I saw some. I haven't heard of some it. lady was kidnapped this morning. Yeah, I didn't hear about that case yet at all. Um, mm -hmm. But that I think goes to back to like education and some of the core principles of Coinstructive and why I started the company and mm -hmm. some of the things that we're doing around education right now and that I've done in the past. So I've worked with the San Diego Diplomacy Council in the past and I, I had a meeting with a, a translator and three Serbian officials oh, wow. who were traveling through the U.S. And I had a like a 90 minute meeting and I explained Bitcoin to them through a translator and, oh, and a whiteboard. And the, one of the reasons they wanted to know is because they, um, and one of the guys was basically like the attorney general for Serbia. Wow. <laughs> um, and he said they had to let somebody go because they didn't know how to prove his guilt. And, uh, they, and they were very bummed out because it was like a really, really big, big case and then the guy basically walked and and so they were very thankful after I was done and actually a guy I used to work with in in the lab at my former science career he's Serbian and I said hey it would be great if you could come with me to this event so I had my own translator <laughs> in case they were saying things and that translator wasn't telling me mm -hmm. and he goes yeah I'll come out I'll, I'll come and I'll help uh, I'll help you and so uh, it was a really great, it was a really great experience and they took a, a lot out of it. So that was, you know, one of the things that I've always been interested in is helping, like I said, people with education. And then recently within the last like 16 months or so, I got involved with a group called the California Financial Crimes Investigators Association, which is a, a group here in, uh, in California, uh, made up of different chapters of both local law enforcement, and that's comprised of federal, state, and local, and then like at the city level, and then also uh, banking compliance professionals. So they come in and they talk about financial crimes and fraud and all kinds of stuff. And, and as a former compliance officer of a Bitcoin ATM company that was started here in Southern California that I helped found, I kind of was introduced to this group through a, a, a former friend in in, the, in San Diego, who had done a presentation to them for them in the past, and he said, "Hey, uh, they contacted me and they said, "Hey, would you come out and do a presentation uh, for one hour at our at our conference, annual conference?" And I said, "Yeah, I'll do that. I'll talk about Bitcoin scams, sure." And then mm -hmm. it turned into, "Hey, why don't you come to our local chapter meetings on a monthly basis and talk to us about stuff?" So I said, "Sure." And then they said, "Hey, well, how about a training?" <laughs> okay, great. So I, I've been working with BitAML and Joe Chicolo to over the last, like, since well, it's been a year, we created a course and we got it certified by the state of California for police officers or peace officers. And we're the only ones in the state of California that can train for continu continuing education credits for oh, law that's enforcement. That's awesome. Yeah. What so we also teach them to look for. So we we go through uh, different uh, scenarios, specifically around um, like how. Well, one of the things we do is we track a transaction. 
So we actually show people like how, you know, you can tell people about a blockchain all day, but until you show how things are actually linked together, people don't necessarily get it. And for some people, visually uh, learning is, uh, an, is an easier way. So well, uh, that's one of the things we talk about. But then we also talk about like how, like you were mentioning, kidnapping. Well, that it's also used in human trafficking cases. And so we just, we, we touch on cases that have already happened so that they're public and we can talk about to certain situations to where things that you can look for, file types, if you have access to a computer. So that not everybody needs to be a forensic specialist, but you need to have at least a basic understanding of the types of questions to ask. So recently I had a conversation with some people out of the state of California's insurance department, and they were investigating two people who were involved in two separate uh, fraud cases for insurance, who apparently had just come together to create a new crypto scam. So these two scammers came together to create a new scam, and we were we were at this conference in um, Vegas, World CryptoCon, I believe, and well, that company apparently was there. I didn't see them there. I didn't know they were there. But after the state in, uh, state insurance people told me about this company, I did some digging and I found a video from World CryptoCon. Oh, so I was like, oh, and I, I looked into it and it's a total MLM. I don't even think there's a blockchain behind it. It's a private portal and there's a Bitcoin address and you send it to it. And it looks like some other scam sites like template, like the back end. like once you log in, it looks like other scams that I've looked at before. Wow. And so uh, I became a certified finance, uh, certified fraud investigator at the end of the year last year uh, to be able Congrats. to get oh yeah thanks uh, to get some more uh, notoriety and some um, clout behind being able to lend my knowledge to to investigations because people don't know even the right questions to ask like a person should be able to pull up the website you know do a few things and have a couple of questions that they know in their head already that they can ask as they're going through things to see whether or not this passes the sniff test. And right now they just don't even know where to start. What so, would, like, uh, what would those questions look like? So where, well, everybody asks, where's the money, right? Where does the money go? So I said to them, the first thing you're going to gonna wanna do is figure out how you actually pay. Like, how do you buy into the scam, right? So go through the sign-up process and get a address, get a Bitcoin address. And if you have the funds, I would send money to that address so that then you can um, be a part of it or use a block explorer or reach out to some of these track and trace companies and you run that address through through those systems and see if it pulls up any... Um, any data that you can start to link uh, large amounts of money to or certain trafficking type of um, red flags or anything really. What would that, like, what would a trafficking red flag look like? So if you're using certain tracking software, they have, they have like blacklisted addresses and they, uh, they know where transactions have come from, from certain geographical locations, right? So let's say- How do they, I always wonder that. Yeah. How do they know the geographic location of the, like, is it from the IP address of the computer yeah. that made it? Yeah, yeah, okay. when, you, when, you, when, you, when you sign the transaction. What about it, VPNs you, then? Yeah, well then, yeah, obviously you can get around that stuff, but not everybody is, trying to cover their always. tracks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's where you get that's where you get people but then you can start to see if you go back far enough like sometimes you can see oh well this was tied to an address that has been associated with fine uh, financing terrorism right and so you can start to ask the, a certain amount so of like questions two or new you, can get, addresses. you could see like okay you've mm -hmm. transacted with these individuals or uh, at least uh, blacklisted addresses and and then and then you can that could be enough 
to like require us to get you a subpoena, right? To be able to go in and uh, go look at these people's, uh, you know, computers and phones and other devices and, and start to then do more of a forensics kind of dig into what's on certain devices and look for wallet addresses or wallet files. And, you know, you can tell people like <laughs> do a file search for dot D A T on a computer. And they're like, well, what's that? Oh, that's that Bitcoin wallet um, <clears throat> file usually. Um, and you know, there's, there's extensions and things that you can look up to help you do a quick search on a device or something that would maybe point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So even if you delete, like if you delete wallets from a phone and things like that, a lot of times there's still a remnants of the log of the install and the uninstall. So there's a lot of things that can still point to, you know, the, the trail uh, so to speak, of who was controlling what and where and, and when. Mm -hmm. And so as this technology proliferates, right, you're still going to have bad people. I mean, as a compliance officer, I saw for an ATM company, I'm just sitting behind the computer watching these transactions and people and with pictures and you just see people show up with the multiple IDs and then you, obviously it's the same person and like different burner phones and you're just like, do you have 13 accounts in like, like 20 days? Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, I just keep, I just keep blocking you and blocking you. Um, and there's not really, um, and I imagine tools will get better maybe for like photo recognition to like, um, link people's accounts together and things like that. But people are always going to try to game the system financially. I mean, I've learned more about financial crimes from talking to the bank people than anybody because fraudulent checks and like wire transfer fraud and oh my god it's like identity theft like it is rampant like wait till crypto gets like super popular I yeah mean, and they're always the fraud fraudsters are everywhere. typically like one or two steps ahead of the bank i remember yeah, I mean, have you been, and I know you do some continuing education as well. Have you been talking to law enforcement or people involved with any type of criminal activity? No, actually, I've just, um, my continuing education is only for other attorneys. So I haven't actually had any, I had one communication with the SEC a couple months ago, um, but that was as close as it got to any uh, other type of law enforcement. But it's really fascinating to hear, you know, how, how it's working and it's good that you're able to educate them with uh you know so they're getting inf the right information on how to deal with this stuff yeah i mean rans ransomware is still rampant you know mm -hmm. I and mean, there's even been police departments that have been shut down by ransomware right wow. I mean, yeah I, 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 I and really, all the golf courses and yeah there's a lot of like hospitals. have you heard about that? The God, they just they or even I think a few weeks ago, all those emails went out to companies where it said like send us twenty thousand worth of Bitcoin or or else kind of thing. There's a bomb in your building, and then there were, turned out there was no bomb, but all these people still got the emails. No, I didn't hear about that fraud. Oh yeah, I think there's like a new fraud every day with Bitcoin. <laughs> I always it seems like it attracts the. Uh, it attracts the really brilliant people on one hand and then the criminals on another hand, but maybe that's like anything in life, I guess. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, and, and I believe also that it's a lot easier to orchestrate a crypto scam than some of the other scams that involve a lot more physical work. Yeah. Right? Like check fraud involves like washing the actual ink and stuff off of checks and or or having to manipulate another person into doing something for you and cashing like yeah. it is it gets really and then like there's you know or installing skimmers to like steal credit card information all that involved and like jackpotting atms mm -hmm. like there's all those yeah. things require a lot of work right but even then if you if you bust a guy for installing skimmers on a credit card machine at a gas station, right, and you link them to a bunch of these thefts, a lot of these people are buying those devices on the dark web or instructions about how to do those things on the dark web. And how are they paying for those things? 
in Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. now it also becomes a it can become a crypto related uh, uh, investigation because now that might build against the case of the online source to where they're purchasing these illegal goods. Mm-hmm. And so it could open up a, a, a much bigger, bigger case because now you have a, a, a transaction that links fraudulent activity to the source of where the, that uh, crime is, is being perpetrated. So yeah. it's really, it's really fun uh, um, to, to see the other side because I'm not a nefarious person. Mm-hmm. But it, it's interesting to see how other people's minds work and how creative and, like you said, br- they're 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 using their brilliance in a lot of ways to create fraud as opposed or crimes as opposed to helping for good. But mm-hmm. you know, and have you it, seen it, uh, it, it that guy from Catch Me If You Can? His name's um, escaping me at the moment, but he's working for the FBI right now uh, on everything that you're talking about, like all the financial crimes and related to Bitcoin. And he came and spoke at a conference in Miami and it was, uh, his story was just incredible as he was talking about all the check fraud he would do. And he, you know, at like 17 years old, went and stole a captain's outfit and just like got on, I forget the number of flights, but it was like in the thousands that he just walked onto the plane lots of times, like as a passenger, but pretending to be like a crew member. And he was just like very cunning and uh, intelligent, it seemed like to stay a step ahead of everyone else. And I thought, oh no, if he's the one uh, investigating all this crypto stuff. <laughs> but it, I don't know why my reaction is like, oh no, I don't want anyone investigating it but really maybe it's going to give more integrity to the uh overall community if certain like if the frauds and the crimes are weeded out and people realize you can't use bitcoin um anonymously to steal money from other people so much yeah i hope so i mean we saw a lot of different you know like the ticket scams and like car insurance scams through the atm company what did they do for car insurance scams so you put up a Craigslist ad for a car and it's a really good deal. And then they say, Hey, would, in order for you to come pick up this car, you have to have insurance on it. Uh, my guy will do it for you. You go down to this ATM, put in 300, $400. It'll cover all of the title transfer, the insurance, blah, 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 blah. And then they go <laughs> and they, you know, they basically give them instructions on how to use a Bitcoin ATM and they've never used one before. And then they call the ATM company and be like, um, hey, I thought this thing is supposed to print me out like <laughs> my tickets or my insurance thing or, uh-uh. and they send it to an off, you know, uh, a wallet that they don't control. Mm-hmm. And so now a lot of the ATM companies and the backend software that people build has a check in place for people that they have to, actually scan you can't manually enter an address Mm -hmm. and now the fraudsters have been like print this out and they take the printed qr code now they're scanning that Mm. and so it's like you try to get ahead of them and then they create something else to make it easier because that's that's the game right so oh and that sucks like of anyone to steal from these people needing the like really cheap cars 300 bucks or 400 bucks to them is probably like a week of food for their family or something and you know it's just uh, I hate hearing oh, yeah. people losing their yeah. money. It's like 10% mm-hmm. of the value of the car probably that they're buying. Or yeah. people, people get scanned for in Southern California for like Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farms or like Legoland tickets because they're trying to take their family and they're like, oh, discount. Mm-hmm. And they see a kiosk. It doesn't look like a traditional bank ATM. So maybe this thing will print out the tickets. Uh, and then they don't. Yeah. So now, now the ATMs have big signs on them. Like if someone asks you to, purchase something for them or if you're trying to buy tickets or all this stuff with big red letters and like stickers on the outside of the machines and Mm -hmm. things to help people be like just give it a second thought you know like we were able to at one point really get lucky and we gave lady back like four thousand dollars oh wow um it was her first transaction and we had alerts set up so that if anybody transaction trend tried to transact over a thousand dollars that it red flagged and needed approval by the system because they wanted to make sure even if they'd put in their information and they were KYC properly that they may not know what they're doing. 
Indeed. And I'd rather freeze a, freeze a transaction and get a confirmation from a person before they actually would like do something and then regret it. And it yeah. turns out that this lady was getting scammed by a fake modeling agency and they were going to take her to New York and do all this stuff. And after she had sent the money, she was like, oh my God, this is a total scam. Uh. But because the, fl- the transaction was flagged, it never completed. So it was a pending transaction and the cash was in the machine and that never sent Bitcoin to the address to the scammer. Oh, so, that's good. <laughs> so she we was able- happy with you guys and your compliance program getting that money back. Yeah. So we were able to pull the, mach- the money right out of the machine and, um, you know, or transfer via bank or whatever. But yeah, she was able to get her cash back. Um, and so it's little things like that, that, you know, have always kind of been exciting for me to help you know, try to stay ahead because look, I, I work hard for, for my income. And if, and if I put it into crypto, I don't want someone trying to steal it. You know what I mean? Like with, with the fact that, you know, owning your own and like proof of keys is your, your responsibility for your own security. And that comes with a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And it's it's gotta be the hardest dangerous whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's, I, it's, I still never feel comfortable like, uh, you know, doing some transactions if it's online, it's fine. But like that, I'm always scared moving it around or it's just a, and I do it like I do a transaction every other day kind of thing. Maybe not like at least, you know, once a week for the last couple of years or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working with it, but it's someone like my mom trying to do, you know, hold her own like Bitcoin. would be It's just not practical yet, but. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, but maybe it's, it's not for everyone. Like they, we don't need everyone like my mom having Bitcoin. No, I, I mean, I think it would be good for her, <laughs> especially in the next, depending on her age. I mean, who knows? It'd be nice to have one or two, right? Um, exactly. Yeah. Well, I've got a few earmarked for her, but. Uh, oh, look at you. What a, <laughs> what a, what a good daughter. Um, do you have siblings? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have a sister and she just had a baby who we're doing. It's actually uh, his one year birthday call on uh, January 12th. And she's having like a time capsule birthday. So she doesn't want presents, but she wants stuff that will be put in this time capsule box and Cole will open them when he's uh, 20. So I'm going to obviously give a little Bitcoin. But uh, That's so cool. That That would be like amazing for him, I'm sure. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it's still here in 20 years and uh, <laughs> working very great. <laughs> uh, yeah, he would be like, oh, Auntie Sasha made me a millionaire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or thanks, Auntie Sasha. Look at this. It's gone to zero. Um, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, no, that's really cool. I, I was actually thinking about something like that recently, about if someone put Bitcoin into a time capsule and what it would look like, even just like five years ago or 10 Mm -hmm. years ago, right? Like that somebody put in like a hundred Bitcoins into a time capsule and opened it 10 years later, they'd be like, oh, Mm -hmm. amazing. This went from fractions of a penny to thousands of dollars. It's, um, it could definitely be um, a a fun and exciting little experiment. So uh, you have to keep us updated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) we'll do reconvene in 20 years, you know. Yeah, we'll do a (laughs) recap. show 20 years from now put on the calendar yeah <laughs> wouldn't that be fun so yeah exactly i, I love it mm-hmm. um so yeah what so besides the education stuff and uh, helping law enforcement and, and and banking compliance people like really think education in general is is like obviously the, the one of the big things you've you've seen so looking forward to working hopefully with you on your continuing education course and bringing some of that to California as well. Oh yeah. And you're coming, are you coming here to Tampa to offer your course? Haven't worked with Gabe and Rosa at, at Block Spaces yet in Tampa about, about actually offering the course in, in Florida. Oh, okay. We have, we have not, we have national accreditation for the banking compliance professionals for, for continuing education. We don't have, um, other states yet for mm-hmm. for the law enforcement so we are looking into we wanted to get a couple courses out of the way first before we started uh, expanding into other states right away but Florida's mm-hmm. on the list as well as you know like 
the DC area, New York, Illinois, Texas. So those are kind of the, the big markets that we're kind of looking into additionally that we'd like to add this year as far as the law enforcement uh, components. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, and I've already actually, I was approached by someone in Florida at a sheriff's department in a, in a particular county who said, Hey, I saw a talk that you did uh, back in 2015. I was just curious about, you know, learning more about Bitcoin. I said, Oh, lucky you. Yeah. Uh, we, have, we have, we have this course and we're looking to bring it. So, um, she, she was very excited about, about learning more. So, and uh, how many, I think how many police officers are, are there across the country? That seems like it's a huge market for, for, you know, the audience for your course. I, you know, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't have a full, uh, I haven't done full market research into the entire nation. But mm -hmm. I believe just in California and only local at the state, at the, excuse me, at the city level is over 40,000. Wow. Yeah. So not everybody though. I mean, not everybody's going to want to take the course because, you know, someone who's, who's writing parking tickets is probably not going to necessarily need to do it. So it really does target more of like detectives and investigators mm -hmm. uh, more so than kind of your average patrol person. Yeah, but I saw a funny um, tweet by Mr. Uh, Jake, uh, I don't want to butcher his last name, Chavinsky, I believe it is. Um, he was saying like, uh, talking about like lawyers, not, not police officers, but you know, in the early night, like in the tech boom, not a lot of lawyers wanted to be involved with the internet. And now if you look at like almost every case has some, you know, some touching on the internet, like it's just, it's, it's interwoven into everything we do now and the same thing might happen over the next decade or so with bitcoin that even writing parking tickets they might need to know about bitcoin at some point if people are you know paying for parking in bitcoin and then they can check the wallet so, like if user interfaces grow a lot uh you know it might be easy they scan something and see oh yeah these people are paid up and or know these people oh you know 20 minutes worth of time who knows but uh, <laughs> it'll be fun to watch it all unfold i think an open time stamps type of of situation uh and uh like what to peter todd is working on with uh, marshall is um is something that could be used by city governments to track things like that you can mm -hmm. you don't have to keep everything on chain all the time right i mean y you can batch and process things and and keep track of things uh, if you're just needing that kind of time time stamp. There's a lot of ways to incorporate blockchain technology into the efficiency of city governments that I think could cut and reduce overhead costs um, significantly with little implementation. Mm -hmm. So so there's a lot of there's a lot of efficiencies that I hope to see being added in the next two and a half years. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next having and, yeah. and seeing what, what's going to transpire because there's a lot of people who've just gotten in and haven't experienced one yet. And I can't wait to see what people's <laughs> reactions are to that. Um, when it starts getting more notoriety and people are paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be exciting. That's for sure. I did that little uh, predictions cast uh, over the holidays and everyone, it seemed, it seemed like most people were predicting 2020 to be kind of the year for Bitcoin or crypto in general. So, uh, yeah, we'll see what, see what happens. Yeah. I, I think that there might be a, uh, a small spike before tax taxes are due this year because mm -hmm. a lot of, I think a lot of people may have been selling on the way down and still need to pay for some of their taxes. So yeah. I think that there'll be a, a small push to drive the price up a little bit so people can cash out some more, which will then cause it to drop back down. And, and yeah. Oh, shoot. Adela's calling right now. Oh, I've been trying to get in touch with her for all, all the last couple of days too. But I'll call uh, she, <laughs> Sorry. She, no, no, she, she, she just texted me like, while we were on the podcast really <laughs> and i and i and i responded to her like 10 minutes ago i said on podcast with sasha <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. See, i guess she just wanted to get some more PR, like some more notoriety yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> she wanted us yeah. to talk about her on there <laughs>
<laughs> I love Adela. Yeah. I'm sad she's not coming, I don't think, to the, the, the Miami conference. And I've only ever been to it with her before. And it's so fun being at a conference with Adela because, like, I wouldn't know you except for her. But uh, she knows everyone everywhere you go. So it's like you feel like you're with the queen or something. <laughs> it's like, oh, Adela. Like everyone's always so excited to see her. And then uh, you get introduced to them. And it's, it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, she was actually how I met Joe Chicolo initially uh, back in 2015 also. Mm -hmm. so her... I think there's a lot of stories of people being introduced through her. Like, uh, it's, yeah, she's awesome. Actually, it was she, before... How did she know I... Joe from Coin Outlet? Or... Actually, I met her in April. I met her like six months before in 2015. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, and I don't know how they got introduced, but they were at an event called Inside Bitcoins, which happened in San Diego and was, I think, the only real big conference that's ever been a, a Bitcoin related crypto conference here in San Diego. And that was in December of 2015. And that's where I met, that's where I met Joe. Uh, and, and of course, Adela was, I was with him. So, nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, 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 I love, I love working in this space. There's a lot of great people. There's a lot of great projects. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of projects that need help. And, you know, we're, that's what we're, our focus is, is to really help companies become successful. And we really like seeing success stories. And, and it, it, that, that's where the fun is for me is, is getting people to that place where they feel good about what they're working on and lower stress levels and, and takes some of those things off their plates. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, and where where can people find you if they want uh, want to get some of your expertise in the consulting nature, or any other well, <laughs> reason to contact you? I guess. But yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to get a hold of us, you can reach us at coinstructive.com. And also, if you want to get a hold of me specifically, you can either email me directly at chris at coinstructive, or you can reach out to me through social media and you can find me pretty much on every social channel uh, known to humankind as <laughs> DJ Kinkle and where did that name come from when I saw <laughs> that beginning? so I I've always been a fan of hip-hop since I was a small child and growing up and in, in the Bay Area mm -hmm. and and I in in college, I was uh, I learned I lived with a DJ who uh, was able to teach me a few things, and he, uh, he was actually a progressive house and like trance DJ, mm -hmm. and he's still actually doing it for like a side gig. He travels all over the world and makes oh, a lot of fun. a lot of extra money doing. It. He's his name is Hoj H O J. He's really he's awesome, mm -hmm. and and so I started. DJing and spinning records like r actual records in college and this was like 2000 2000 2001 mm -hmm. and um or ni 99 2000 2001 and and so I oh well, my buddies and I were on a on a radio program on on the on the college campus at UC Davis and we recorded ourselves onto an actual tape, <laughs> which we played, which we played back later. And we were pretty, like, we were pretty drunk. And we went in. It was like after midnight when we had a friend on the radio show, and started making crazy names. And somebody said Chris Kringle, and there was a, a variation. And somebody said Chris Kinkle, and then next next thing you know, people were introducing my friends were introducing me as Chris Kinkle. <laughs> and then uh, I had a huge bunch of people who I would get, like, even in college, I would get wedding invites and everything would be addressed as Chris Kinkle. Oh, wow. <laughs> really stuck. And, yeah. And, and so I thought it was a fun DJ name. And then when I started Twitter, I didn't think I'd ever use it the way I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so by the time I had actually started conversating with people in 2013, a lot on Twitter, I was like, well, I'm not going to change it now. It's, uh, it's too late. And, yeah, and it's kind you know, of fun. <laughs> it is fun, and it reminds me of like um, being able to DJ. I, I would love to get some decks. I don't have tables um, of my own right now, 
But I, I lo- you know, the thing I loved about it the most about DJing, I don't know if you've ever tried it or done it. I haven't, uh, but I've watched a lot of people do it. <laughs> so beat matching takes a lot of, um, a lot of energy and focus to, to get that, to get it to sound like they're, it's all one giant long song. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and I've always felt like it was something that was like an escapism where I couldn't really do anything else. And plus I got, I was, you know, I danced while I would do it. And it was a sense of an accomplishment when you would like make a really good mix. Mm. And, and so, and I couldn't do anything else, right? I couldn't take phone calls. I had the headphones yeah. on and it was just me and the music and me creating. And I've so, heard that before about music of like guitar playing and stuff. It's like you don't, your brain is so focused on what you're doing that there's no room for worry. So it brings you to like a higher vibration to do a beat. It's almost like meditating because you literally have to block everything else out except what you're doing, which there's not a lot of other activities uh-huh. where that has to happen. Which is why I really also like scuba diving. Oh yeah, I haven't tried scuba diving. <laughs> uh, well, you're in a good spot for it. I'd, I'd be out in the water all the time. It's warm out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but think about it, no phones. You are surrounded by um, a, a really conductive material because there's a lot of salt in the ocean, right? And mm-hmm. so you get that, you get that, and it's cold and you're under pressure. So you get almost like the feeling of being in a hyperbaric chamber, which has been proven to be really good for your health. And then you're concentrating on your breathing because you got a tank on and you want to maximize your time underwater. So you're really slow, controlled uh, breath and you're like on a nature hike underwater. So you kind of go slow and you look at stuff and you can't be bothered by anything. So you focus. And to me, it's kind of like a, a, a slight meditation as well. Oh, yeah. You're making me want to try it. Out. I've, I've been a daredevil on a lot of other um activities but i've never done scuba diving for some reason like i have a, i've been in cro- i've had a lot of opportunities to do it and I've, I've always like chickened out or just watched everyone else do it <laughs> but, it's not but, that hard it, it costs about four hundred dollars to to do the course and buy all the the initial gear that you need like a mask and gloves and fins and stuff mm-hmm. and snorkel and other than that you, that's it. it it they'll do it in like a couple weekends and then you're in the pool and then you're in the ocean yeah <laughs> with um, the sharks <laughs> just kidding sharks are awesome i have a video on my youtube that's like one of the only youtube videos i have of some really awesome sharks oh wow um, so they're more scared of you than they are of um or you are of them mm-hmm. and uh I, I need to find more crypto people, man. Put together maybe like a, a scuba trip. That would be awesome. Oh yeah, crypto yeah. Scuba trip. So, okay. <laughs> uh, what do you, what do you do for a- escapism from the crypto space? Because trust me, there is no shortage of work and things to do in this space. And sometimes, if you don't rip yourself away, like it's hard to get away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, this year it just it's been hard to get away. Like I haven't. Um, I haven't taken a lot of breaks from it, but I did join like a triathlon team in Tampa and I was doing that quite a bit over the summer, but I uh, ended up hurting my back as I was training for this half uh, Ironman. So I've been kind of lazy the last couple months, but, but I do like to get out in nature when I can. But this, like, I think this, this past year was more time spent sitting in my recliner chair than any previous year I've ever had. <laughs> are, are you a runner? Yeah, yeah. Is that was that your big thing? Um, well, I grew up swimming and a lot of kayaking, actually. So that of the three, that's like my I am faster on the like compared to other people on the swim compared to the run. But I much prefer like the activity of running. Like for some reason, I don't like getting wet anymore. <laughs> so, like it just I, I think I overdid the swimming when I was uh, younger. I was really competitive with it. And, now just diving in the pool I always have a bit of an aversion <laughs> to getting in <laughs> well maybe the, maybe scuba diving is the thing for you I and mean, the ocean makes you puts you in much of a different perspective <laughs> yeah and when you were saying going slow thinking of your breathing like that all sounds really nice compared to like get in go as fast as you possibly can for as long as you can <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly competitive there's no competitive scuba diving <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like, I saw more coral than you did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. And maybe unless you're lobster diving, uh, in which case that, that is a challenge, but um, yeah, <laughs> but yes, it, it is, it is totally worth it. And, um, I highly recommend trying mm-hmm. it if you, if you get a chance, you nice. love it. Maybe it'll go on the goal list for this year. Get out scuba diving. Cause it does look yeah. like a nice appeal. Let me know if you need any help figuring stuff out. Okay. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> and thank you for coming on for your time today. It was uh, really educational for, for me, especially learning about what, you know, all the um, law enforcement side of things, like how you look at the transactions and whatnot. That was really good information. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on the show. I haven't been on a lot of podcasts. It's great to catch up with you. And uh, like, and if, like I said, if anybody needs to get a hold of me, they have the information and I'm mm-hmm. happy, to, uh, happy to help in as many different ways as I can in this industry. And uh, let's have a more continued success in 2019, right? Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye, Chris. Bye.